In today's episode on the Dive Saga channel, we are going to have a look at all the equipment that was needed for our last episode, ice diving in Lake Superior. Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode on the Saga channel. Today on location we're being hosted by Divers Incorporated in Ann Arbor, Michigan. That's not a coincidence because they were the hosts and the logistical support for our last episode. If you haven't seen that episode, definitely check it out because this episode hinges on that. We are going to have a look at all the equipment needed and used for our ice diving episode. The view is mesmerizing. We are in a completely different world. The opaqueness of the ice is determined by the speed of freezing. Ice that freezes slowly is more transparent. The faster the ice froze, the milkier it looks. Special guest today, Steven Ainsley, ice diving instructor trainer. He's going to take out some cool tools as well. Let's start with staying warm. So this is me personally. Everybody might have different uh, preferences, what they like to use. Um, I was very fortunate and very happy with my uh, Scuba Pro K2 undergarments here. They kept me really warm, much warmer than I thought they would have, to be really honest. Super thick. And um, I think it's like a blend of uh, polyester and nylon uh, absorbed moisture really well, meaning that I wasn't sitting in my own sweat, wasn't really, um, you know, getting cold by sweating. So that was the bottom layer. Don't think I could have done it without that. Um, I think a wetsuit or sorry, a dry suit is great, uh, keeps you dry, but it does nothing if you can't stay warm first. So the undergarments, super important. If you're just going to wear uh, a shirt or a sweater under a, uh, a dry suit, not only are you maybe not going to be as comfortable as you can be, but that's also not really designed to regulate temperature appropriately. Which brings us to the dry suit. And so for my personal choice of dry suit, I went with the uh, Scuba Pro Evertech um, dry suit. That's a tri-laminate suit, works really, really well. A couple of things I really like. First of them is that the, um, the booties are integrated into the suit, so you don't need to put extra booties over top. And uh, lots of big pockets, both zippers and Velcro. So if you're on the surface, you're having a long day, you're tending to other divers in the hole, those pockets are great for maybe putting some uh, dry gloves, wet gloves, um, just switching out equipment as you go. That's that's really great. And then in my uh, personal situation, I used uh, I used dry gloves on top. So um, right here we have the uh, ring system and a pair of nice dry gloves with just some inner liners just to keep you warm. Um, I, I expected full on to be absolutely tingling in my fingers and that wasn't even the case. So I stayed super dry, but especially super warm. And these are nice because they click right in and then you twist the ring and the gloves are locked. So super solid uh, solution and very easy to do. Now I didn't only bring the dry gloves. I also brought some uh, five millimeter wet gloves. Now I didn't dive in these, but they were very useful just on the surface, uh, providing surface support for the other divers. I find that in my dry gloves, I don't have the best possible dexterity uh, simply because they're bigger, my fingers are a little thicker. And so these five millimeter wet gloves, even though they are five millimeter, they still provide a nice bit of dexterity for handling lines, assisting other divers, maybe clipping them up, um, getting them in and out of the water. And the nice thing is that when these get a little too wet and a little too cold, just take them off, shove them in the pockets, uh, take another pair. So that kind of keeps you going as surface support uh, diver. Then for the hood, I simply used a five millimeter wet hood was perfect. Um, I expected full on to have a massive brain freeze, but that really didn't happen. Now, part of this is probably because the surface was actually colder than the, uh, the water. So by the time we got in the water, we're sort of used to it. Um, but for me, a five millimeter wet hood 
perfect, did the job. Now, in terms of actual dive equipment, um, you, if you're gonna use a dry suit, you're probably gonna use a uh, little heavier fins. So I have these uh, jet fins right here. They're known for being very, very heavy. Um, it's a bit of a pain in the butt to travel with, but uh, it does do the job in terms of keeping your legs down in the suit. So um, yeah, absolutely my number one choice for this, uh, this dive uh, trip and it paid off big time in terms of uh, what it needed to do. Now, because I had some bulk on the fin side of things they are kind of heavy I decided to trim it way down in the BCD area so I went with the uh, the scuba pro hydros uh, pro and the nice thing about the scuba pro hydros pro is that it's absolutely a travel BCD so it completely folds up into almost nothing um, and I don't really use my BCD anyway when I'm uh, dry suit diving you can just offset the buoyancy with the dry suit so Honestly, this is a kind of a glorified backpack for your cylinder, and that's about it. Do need something with metal D-rings, of course, so you can clip off the, uh, the safety line. Now, um, in terms of regulators, this is a bit of a controversial choice, but you see probably there's a theme going here. I used a lot uh, of Scuba Pro equipment, my favorite. And as far as ice diving goes, regulators, there are really not that many regulators that are suitable for ice diving. Now, uh, I went with the Scuba Pro Mark 17, which is their cold water uh, first stage and a G260. I expected a bit of problems in terms of uh, um, freezing and uh, free-flowing perhaps, but that really wasn't the case. Um, it helps a lot to just not use the regulator at all until you're in the water, immediately go under, take a breath, push yourself under the ice and uh, not too far of course, and get acclimatized. As long as you do not resurface, you do not give the wet regulator a chance to freeze, um, you may be fine. Now, if you've never ice dived before, if you're taking ice diving classes, definitely follow the advice of your ice diving instructor because a regulator free flow can thoroughly ruin the dives. Um, in my case, this one absolutely paid dividends and um, it worked for me. Dive computer, um, you know, to be really honest, in my case, a bit of an afterthought because the dives were very close under the sheet of ice, so uh, not really that much depth. Still need a dive computer, of course, so I used the, uh, the G2 Tech, another Scuba Pro product. Uh, it's just a really good tech computer, um, really good overall product, nice big screen, so when you're already handling a lot of things, um, the last thing you wanna do is kind of look on a tiny screen what you need the information right there uh, then and there and that's in a nutshell what I used on uh, our last ice diving trip kept me warm kept me safe however we do need some specialized equipment as well because you can't just gear up and jump in the ice you need a place to jump and a way to do it safely and for that I have special guest Stephen Ainsley he's an ice diving instructor trainer and he's going to give us some explanations about that and remember, subscribe to the Saga channel if you like this kind of stuff. And maybe also tell me what your opinion is about all uh, of these items. So the first piece of kit that we need to consider is using a sled, okay? Just a little handheld sled that we pull behind. We put the gear on there to transport it out to the ice. It may sound simple and basic, but we use this because at first that ice sheet is unknown. So it's a bit of a precautionary walk out onto the ice. And we use those sleds to help distribute the weight instead of carrying things and centering that weight where we could actually put too much pressure on the ice. We back and forward, back and forward until all of the gear is out there. Once we actually get to the location, it's time to now clear the snow. So what we use are a couple of big snow shovels and we clear an area that is wider than the hole we're gonna cut, okay? This is to allow tenders and safety divers to be able to actually have access to the hole without kicking too much snow or any of the peripheral ice back into the hole. So it just helps keep that area clear. If there is heavy snowfall as well, this is actually quite convenient to have those shovels because we can keep that, that area nice and clear. The next thing we have is a very specialized piece of equipment and I always think this is the coolest part about ice diving. When I ask the question, what pieces of kit do you use to do your diving? Very rarely does anybody say a chainsaw. 
So we use a chainsaw and by using this, this is what helps us cut the hole in the ice. Now this is obviously very specialized equipment and I wouldn't advise anybody handle one and just go cutting holes in the ice if you haven't already used one. So this helps us cut a hole in the ice. It's obviously limited to the, the depth of the ice is limited to the length of the blade, but we can still cut a hole and then finish that off using a handsaw, which has a much longer blade. After the hole is cut, we just use some picks and some pries like crowbars to move the ice that is being that is being cut away from the hole. Now there are different schools of thought on that. We can push it down and under, but we have to make sure that it doesn't freeze on the underside of the ice sheet. What we can do with smaller holes and more time, but weather permitting, is actually cut that block up into pieces and remove it from that ice hole. Again, the style of diving you do is going to be dependent on which method you use. Once the hole is cut, however, the next thing we need to do is we need to secure some ice, um, some ice screws. So these are specialized pieces of equipment here. They literally just screw into the ice towards either side of the hole that you cut. And that helps us um, secure the lines so that they're not going to go anywhere. They are now anchored into the ice. So screwed all the way into the ice and then we have these little rings here which we can clip the lines to and this is what the tenders will use to keep the divers safe underwater. Now the line. The line again it is just line that we use and what we do here is we create a bit of a lasso in the end which the diver is going to step through You step through it and then we can just secure it here. We've also fashioned a carabiner into the line itself, which can now clip onto any of the D-rings that are on your equipment. And this is a locking carabiner as well. So by doing this, what we've done is we've given two points of contact where the diver is secured to the line. The other end of the line, if we remember, is clipped into the ice screw, which is anchored up above on the ice sheet. And that line is tendered by a person who is controlling the line, taking in the slack and letting out the diver. This is specialized equipment for ice diving. And like I said earlier, the different types of ice that you dive in and the different environments where you do it may call for different, different equipment. But here on our trip, this is the equipment that we used. Now, a lot of you also had questions about the camera equipment we used to shoot that episode. That's because a lot of you follow us on Instagram where we usually release content early in little bits and it's a great place to get interactive and ask questions. So for those following uh, and asking questions, the um, camera gear pretty straightforward. So uh, if you go back in time on this channel, you will see that I use a, um, a sea frog uh, dive housing for my uh, Panasonic GH5. And that's a bit controversial because it is a super, super, super low end housing. And that's always a risk. If your housing costs less than your camera, then the thing that might get sacrificed first is the camera. Now I'm still shooting this episode on that camera, so it's definitely still working. This is that housing. And then here we have the Inon uh, strobe light for um, for pictures. I didn't really shoot too much photo because I was very focused on the uh, the video content for uh, our last episode there. And then an Orca Torch 5000 lumens video light. Anytime you're gonna be in a darker or overhead type of environment, that's just uh, a good thing to have. It makes the images a little bit clearer that way. Now, you'll see that I also kind of zip tied a GoPro to the bottom uh, or to the top rather of the camera. And that is so that when I'm filming, I put this uh, GoPro, uh, it's a 10 in super view. And that way I can still get a nice um, sort of perspective of myself diving as well. That works really well because that way, when we're showing some of the footage under the ice, we can also cut back to my uh, um, face. Not saying that that's necessarily what everybody wants to see, but it's a nice way to cut between the different shots, keeps it nice and varied. And then we also had some, uh, um, some pretty cool looking surface shots and um, I was considering bringing a drone but I, I sort of anticipated that with snowfall a lot of drones don't do well when there's uh, 
water or snow getting into the uh, into the propellers and that's why I uh, got this Insta360 uh, X3 uh, 360 camera and it's actually uh, it's mounted on a 10 foot pole and that allows you to give a, a drone-like effect. So we were able to hover over the ice hole uh, without actually flying any device. Um, and this thing is also waterproof down until 10 meters, 30 feet. So uh, we were even able to stick it in the freezing water, get some spectacular shots without compromising the camera. And that actually helped in uh, sort of giving more life to the episode as well. So basically a GoPro 10, a Panasonic G H5 and an Insta360 uh, X3 were the uh, the three cameras that we used for that specific episode. I hope that answered a lot of questions uh, from everybody and I always like it when people comment and interact because it gives me something to go by. That way I know that you like the content or maybe you don't like the content and we can steer the channel in another direction. As you notice we've been actually working really hard in providing additional quality content more than ever before so if you like that kind of stuff consider subscribing to the channel, liking the video, leaving a comment and maybe even sharing it with your friends. I want to thank you guys so much for watching and I want to thank Divers Incorporated in Ann Arbor, Michigan for letting us host this episode and also of course for the logistics of the ice diving trip. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you next time.